Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Beta Zone session on 35.3 million refugees at a critical juncture. My name is Alexander Betts. I'm Professor of Forced Migration and International Affairs at the University of Oxford. We're going to begin this session with some opening remarks by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, who I'd like to welcome to the stage. Thank you, Alex, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And I will start by contradicting Alex immediately, not um, completely, but partly, in saying that, yes, I think it's very good and correct to say that there are 35.3 million refugees today in the world. The reality is that there are, at our latest counts, 114 million people that have had to flee their homes because of the same causes that push the 35.3. So the 35.3 is part of a larger forced displacement phenomenon. I mean, Alex, I know you know, but uh, just for the sake of the argument, that, uh, um, that, uh, in, that prevails in the world today. 114 million people, so many of them are displaced inside their country, are refugees inside their country. So technically they're not called refugees, but they all flee from the same causes. 114 million is the largest number we have recorded since we started counting in a relatively reliable way. And uh, it says a lot about the state of our world. And uh, the first point I want to make is that, please, those here, those online, others here at the forum whose, um, whose purpose is committed to improving the state of the world, the state of the world will not improve, I don't know if unless, but certainly until the plight of these 114 people is not addressed. And uh, in a world which is so busy focusing on a number of global challenges, like, uh, of course, conflict, but also climate, pandemics, uh, poverty, uh, I think it is important to re recall and remind everywhere, everybody that this issue of forced displacement, which often is the result of all other challenges combined, not be forgotten and be treated as well as one of the great global challenges of our time. Unfortunately, we tend to remember about refugees, about displaced, when there is a big emergency. When uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and started bombing the country and millions of Ukrainians crossed European borders, everybody suddenly remembered that there was something like forced displacement in the world. And, uh, but we should not wait for the crisis or for the acute phase of the crisis to remember. We should try to internalize that it is important for the sake of peace and for the sake of the future of the world not to forget these 114 million people. The causes of flight, if you want to call them like this, are increasingly complex and intertwined. Surely UNHCR continue as the custodian of the definition, of the, of the law related to refugees continues to say that that distinction between those that flee because of uh, compulsion, because of conflict, because of persecution, discrimination, violence in different forms, and people f moving, sometimes fleeing because of other reasons, that distinction needs to be maintained not least because refugees have a legal construct in their favor, not always applied, increasingly less applied, but still existing, that needs to be preserved. Otherwise, we lose out on a huge segment of the world human rights construction. So it's important to continue to maintain that distinction, not forgetting, of course, that all other people that also move more and more often alongside the same routes, more and more often trafficked, smuggled by the same criminal gangs. Also, the other people have human rights, have rights, in fact, and uh, have aspirations, just like the refugees. This is why UNHCR increasingly cooperates with the other UN agency dedicated to human mobility, IOM, 
they are more focusing on the migration aspects, we on the refugee aspects, but we fully recognize that there is a commonality of situations that need to be addressed, not to mention rescue at sea, not to mention uh, 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 basic humanitarian assistance and so forth, which are common to everybody on the move. Just a couple of other points by way of, um, of um, uh, uh, you know, starting this conversation. One, very important, to also avoid focusing on this phenomenon only when people arrive at the borders of rich countries. Because unfortunately, very often, this is the way it is all framed. It is people coming to the rich countries, so it's a problem for the rich countries to resolve. And most commonly, because there's so much political manipulation around that, the problem is um, resolved, or states claim to resolve it by simply saying, we stop, we close, we push back, it's not our problem. We know that this is not only wrong, profoundly wrong, because there are obligations that states have, especially for those seeking asylum, but it is also simply not working. This is what I always say. There is a bit of a polemic here between people like me and some people in governments. They say that the traditional way of addressing refugee flow doesn't work, so we have to reinvent the wheel. I say that actually that works, and it is the, um, the, um, the pushback approach that is actually counterproductive and doesn't work. So it's an open question, and I think it is important to continue uh, to uh, debate. Finally, uh, just to say, um, first of all, it is important, and we're increasingly saying this to government, to look at these complex flows as a long journey, right? We call this now, it's not a very nice expression, but I think it explains, let's have a route-based approach. So not, you know, these issues will never be resolved in one point or the other of these long uh, journeys that people on the move are making. They have to be addressed at every segment. Many people would like not to take the risks that are inherent to these long journeys if they could have um, access to opportunities along the way. And you would be amazed about how many opportunities can be built around the way in terms of access to services, to employment, and so forth. Granted, those ways, those journeys cross poor countries, fragile countries, so it makes it more complicated, but it is not impossible to create those opportunities. And the work that organizations like mine, like IOM and others are doing with development actors, in particular in creating access to health, to uh, uh, education, and uh, to employment, and we'll discuss this further in another meeting today, is, are, are really the future, I think, because humanitarian assistance in itself, which is the traditional way through which support to refugees has been seen, the traditional prism, is notoriously and even increasingly volatile and short-term. Last year, my organization had to cut 1,000 positions out of 20,000 at a time when the world needs a strong UNHCR. And the same happens for other organizations simply, sim simply because the funds are not, are not sufficient. My very final point since we're here in Davos and I'll close is to say um, the other big uh, direction we're moving is really to say these things are not just for organizations like ours or governments. They are for everybody. The whole of society response that was somehow codified or, how can I say, described in the Global Compacts on Refugees and Migration that the UN approved a few years back, these toolboxes really describe how different segments of society can respond. Not just states, but for example, big time, the private sector. And this is an important uh, message, the private sector can play a key role, not just as a philanthropic actor, although that's very important as well, but as a partner. As a partner, through know-how, through working together, we've done amazing stuff with companies, with corporations, with foundations in many parts of the world, really innovative in terms of sustainable, uh, sustainable care for refugees and giving them opportunities. That's the way to move on in this fraught world to address this global challenge. Thank you.
Thank you very much, High Commissioner, for these opening remarks. In order to build on what you've said and importantly reminding us that forced displacement is a major global challenge of our time, I want to take a deep dive into a very particular context, a particular context where the World Economic Forum has worked. I had the privilege to co-lead two leadership journeys taken by World Economic Forum young global leaders to the Kakuma refugee camps. And building on that, there's a global shapers hub now in the Kakuma refugee camps in Kenya, the first shapers hub in a refugee context anywhere in the world. In my work, I focus on the economic lives and contributions of refugees and try to showcase that through data. And I'm going to draw upon some of that research to tell you a little bit about the Kakuma context in Kenya. And then when we move to the panel discussion, we'll broaden globally and think about what implications it has for the wider world. Now, there are a lot of things that are very challenging about the Kakuma refugee camps, home to some 200,000 refugees. If Kakuma were a city, it would be Kenya's seventh largest city. But unlike many cities, it's historically faced significant challenges. Inconsistent water supply, lack of connection to road infrastructure, lack of connectivity to the national grid. And many people face significant challenges. The right to work, freedom of movement are restricted for refugees in Kenya. But when you go below the surface, you see a community with skills, talents, and aspirations. You find over 3,000 entrepreneurial businesses across the camps. You discover that at one point, half the refugee Olympic squad came from the Kakuma refugee camps. You find that there's, there are 700 football teams across the camps playing competitive football. And you discover, as the IFC revealed, a camp where the economy is worth more than $56 million a year in annual expenditure. And so there is potential and human capital in that population. Yes, vulnerability, but also enormous capability. Now, one of the challenges, of course, of explaining what it's like in Kakuma is not all of you can go to Kakuma in person. But I hope that we can transport you there a little bit in what I've got to say. To do that, we've embarked on a new project with colleagues at the University of Oxford and also colleagues living in Kakuma called Refugee Stories. And in that project, we're working with a refugee film crew based in Kakuma. And really, that story is about recognizing that when we see human stories in refugee camps, they're often decontextualized. They often are unrepresentative of the wider population. You don't know who or what they represent within the data. So we've tried to create data-driven human stories to collect representative data of the entire population, then be able to map out, for instance, the income distribution of the Kakuma refugee camps, but then go to particular points on the curve, zoom in, and meet the people. And I want to tell you a little bit about that briefly to open up the Kakuma story. So in looking at the economy of Kakuma, we discover that it is a deprived community, poorer than the general host population in the Kenyan context. So we see, for instance, at the global level, that the median income per day is around eight US dollars. In Kenya, it's around five US dollars. But in Kakuma, it's less than two US dollars a day below the World Bank's extreme poverty line. And that's a reflection of the very different geographical environment, but also the very different institutional context in which Kakuma finds itself. But the data alone is somewhat dry. So what we've also done is to try to map out that curve and identify particular people who sit on that curve. So through our representative data, we've been able to identify the households that are at different deciles. First decile, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, all the way up to 100%, and zoom in and meet the people. So Rose is at the first decile, the 10th percentile. She's from South Sudan. Abdi Razak, on the other hand, from Somalia, sits at the eighth decile. Rose, as you'll see, is largely dependent on humanitarian assistance and in debt. Abdi Razak, on the other hand, has been able to build a small business, gradually a challenging business, but he's been able to build it. And Abdi Razak's daily income is about twice that of Rose. So I want to introduce you to them and hear from them in their own words. So here is Rose's story. <laughs> 
Jamanu ayo no watak geru akap, ya oke lim gana geru abelit, kira ni tebi bagar bara, janta beru ape kaim bayal. Iya ina kulu, five ibede. Sokoltan ma fiala na gisa kalle, jana na bisa do ocho ratai, best ana gaku bamba. Bama siapa? Jibu guru, ya ana kan guru najil, ana gerwa, ana gili gole si di dokan, ana gede wakel. Guru tay, bega ti salep, ma fiala ana reja fibet. Asha ana gerwa gidam beden, jekan bedi refi fibet. Aja kulu ana babiu, babiu. Kata i le, ana si boleh si dudukan, akel kana na jebo. Pibet magi si lo zaman ana gibiu, kasap magi si timu syar. Ya ana galah go syar tane guam. And now we'll hear from Abdi Razak. Kuntan isha najira, mesi an kau dah syain Somalia way onga payda. Islam tadi dua hari dulu, mungkin kedua hari dulu, kemudian kedua hari dulu. Oh, anak aku antik juga le, ini saya. Lepas kan aku mah, lepas tu benda nak keluar sokul mai, pabu bagu monda askar anak saya berayu aku kutubai, anak garis gaya tu aku kutubai. Datuk askar berian jadi, wahai dia jadi orang kahar isi ya, orang telefon kan gak sedo, orang kiri sos sedo dia dah, nak tak dia dah. 2016 kita furu, orang tu antara an furu tu kan ke garis gaya suha, saya nak cakap ni, saya nak cakap ni, marbus cantok. Kontang sini meldek, lepas tu kau meldek, kontang meldek, sana ulah, hujan mereka an ini aruran, ia mesyam kau disihat. Wahang kata, wah dat ke ad un abah kata word, wahai ini siaran kata, anak mana abo, wah nak kata, naf naf tak igisi, ini anak kata, lepas tu kau kau mtalo igisi, la agak apa dana, la agak apa dana, mesyam kau tu agak mtalo. أقل بسر سر سياسة السكوة ده مو ملء الأكتالو أو واحد لقصة قادة بس مو جيدة. So these stories have been developed by a very talented filmmaker, Raphael Bradenbrink, working collaboratively with a film crew based in Kakuma, and there'll be more of them representing different data points released during the year. What does this mean for the global context, recognizing that in Kakuma life is challenging, but entrepreneurship, employment create opportunities for people? Well, we've heard that in last year's data, there are around 108 million people displaced, including those internally displaced around the world. And in that data set, around 35 million are displaced as refugees who have crossed the border, fleeing war or authoritarian regimes leading to persecution. Now, what's important to recognize is that the majority of refugees are not actually in rich countries or not traveling to rich countries. Some 76% are hosted in low and middle income countries, a little bit like Kenya, for instance. The majority, following the trend of urbanization around the world, also live in cities. But there's variation in that. So in Kenya and in East Africa, the vast majority still live in camps or camp-like context, which is a reality for many people. It's also important to recognize, though, that in a context like Kakuma, contrary to media publicity or political narratives, very few move on irregularly to rich countries. So in our data collection, we followed a representative sample of the Kakuma population over time, after one year, after two years. And we found that population was highly mobile, often moving within the camp, often moving between cities in Kenya, quite often moving across borders to neighboring countries like Uganda. But the proportion in any given year who moved on from Kakuma to rich countries irregularly was less than 0.1%. So that idea of waves of people coming from refugee camps to rich countries is a distortion of the reality. The question then is what should governments and business do? And one key aspect of this is the right to work and the opportunity to work, where business and government can work together. In some of our research, we've looked globally at the right to work and coded which countries give refugees the right to work legally, de jure, and also in practice, de facto. The darker colors represent those that in practice are not offering refugees the right to work, are restricting their rights and freedoms to work and engage socioeconomically. The lighter countries 
um, are more likely to have progressive, inclusive economic policies towards refugees. It's coding based on reflections by international humanitarian organizations, and it includes data from those countries that hosted more than a certain number of refugees when we collected data. One thing we found that resonates with what Filippo highlighted was that one of the key factors in driving this variation is whether countries have signed and ratified the 1951 Convention. It's really important that countries adhere to those legal standards. It translates into this kind of openness. What we also find when we compare refugees' outcomes in Kenya with restrictions on the right to work, with those in Uganda where there is a right to work, looking at the same populations, Somali refugees, Congolese populations, that holding all other factors constant, the Ugandan model of giving refugees the right to work is associated with 16% higher incomes for refugees than the alternative. It's better for displaced people to have that right to work. We also find in our research that being able to engage in employment or entrepreneurship is correlated with higher incomes, greater subjective well-being, improved food security, better mental health, and improved physical health outcomes for refugees. But it's not only refugees who benefit. We know from research done in Europe that when refugees are perceived to make an economic contribution, they're more likely to be welcomed by receiving populations. In our research, we found that in camps in Uganda, Ethiopia, Kenya, when refugees engage in economic transactions through entrepreneurship or through employment relationships, the host community is more likely to have a tolerant and appreciative attitude of their presence. What's really important to recognize, though, is that there are people who thrive, who leave contexts like Kakuma and go on to make significant contributions. In Kakuma, despite the income distribution I showed, there are also outliers. Innocent Javier Imana has created a successful soap business, thriving, exporting, and being able to employ refugees and members of the host community. Mesfin Getahun runs one of the largest food wholesalers in Kakuma, even selling the food he produces to the WFP to distribute. And one of the things we've been able to do as a university is create an initiative called the Refugee-Led Research Hub based in Nairobi. And it provides opportunities for refugees to lead their own research, producing publications on citizenship outcomes for refugees, refugees' outcomes in accessing work permits, for instance, but also has created pathways for many people, including from Kakuma, to have access to graduate scholarships in Oxford and around the world. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to move on to the discussion that we'll have with our panelists and invite Allah and Ibru to come to the stage, please. So I think in this discussion around whether this is a critical juncture, um, there's sort of two elements that we really want to explore. The challenge, what is that critical juncture? Is it a critical juncture? For whom is it a critical juncture? And what are the key elements that leave us to be at this transition point and make this such a defining global challenge? And also the solutions. So perhaps let's start with the critical juncture. Alar, what does it look like for you? For whom is this critical? And is it different from previous contexts? And thank you so much. That was such an incredible presentation. And I think the, the importance of people's agency is, is arguably, I think, at the core of all of this. And um, for a huge part of my work, I was born in Canada, moved to Libya when I was uh, a teenager, where I, where I lived through the revolution and, and really focused on women, peace, and security, and working with populations, and now lead a lot of global health work. And I think one thing that is true for me when we're assessing whether or not something is a critical juncture is who is the community that we're anchoring at the center of that story. And I think if you go to the vast majority of refugees, particularly those, for example, in Kakuma who have been there for decades, they will tell you it's been critical for a while. It's not just critical because, to your point, there's different media attention or there's different politics, but it has been critical for a while. And I think for the international community, just given where we are and, and the audience we're speaking with, I think it's important to recognize that we should also see it as critical because it is an abdication of our responsibility and our commitment to our global community. To your point, we have conventions. They've been ratified. We have institutions that should be supported. And yet, the conversation only ends up being seen as critical when it meets the headlines in particular countries. And it doesn't negate the fact that this is a lived reality for so many, for millions of children and women and families and men, 
around the world and where they deal with this reality, be it in terms of employment, of food security, of nutrition, of basic health care services. I mean, look at maternal mortality, where the number is staggering in, community, in refugee communities and, and in IDP communities as opposed to the general population. And you wonder, we're in 2024, do we not have an accountability to these communities, especially when we have said that that is the international community's purpose? Right? And so, so I think it's been critical for a very long time. And I think, I do think that these conversations should be had as much in Kakuma as they should be had here in terms of what then are the solutions in these communities. So we've been failing many people in protracted situations for a long time. And just because we now proclaim this to be a crisis in the media or in rich countries, it doesn't necessarily mean it hasn't been a crisis for many people individually and personally for a very long time. Ibru, um, you work in the private sector in Turkey. We've looked at the African context a little bit. What does this look like in the Turkish context? Um, thanks for the question, because I was thinking how, how critical it is. And for the past 10 years, it's very critical for Turkey, because we have been receiving Syrian refugees for the past 10 years, and it's more than 4 million now. And probably more than a million babies were born already in Turkey. So, and at this moment, we feel, we see that as, uh, as it's been said, you know, the, they're pushed back by the boats of some other countries and Turkish naval forces are saving these people. I mean, this is a very critical moment in the world as well. I mean, this is a problem of the world. This is a problem of the developed countries as well, because we are taking care of these 4 million people and we, they are socially in Turkey. And actually, we made a documentary about it with Atlantic Council two years ago about four successful women who came to Turkey from Syria, from the border, walking, just by their suitcases. And one of them become a very good cook. The other one is a radio reporter. The other one is like a wedding planner. And the fourth one is established a language school. And they were outliers, maybe, but they created very good examples. And at this moment, also we faced a forced displacement because we had a very big earthquake in 11 cities. Ten, more than 10 million people has to be has forced to change their locations. So I think the most important thing is now, as the world, we have to think to sort these issues or sort solve these problems at the source, rather than spending millions tons of money for the arms or getting arms of all the countries. Maybe we can sort these issues at the source countries because nobody wants to be displaced, right? I mean, why do you want to change your country? The title of our documentary was, do, why do seagulls migrate? I mean, there should be a reason. If we don't sort these issues out, and as you have described, if, as they're not good outliers, I'm just afraid that these people have nothing to lose, so they can just be terrorists as well. So my position, my proposition is, we cannot let this 114 million people to get higher in numbers. We have to go to the source, sort these issues out in the countries itself. So there's a real challenge of needing to support peace, end conflicts around the world, and ensure people are not displaced in the first place. But once people are displaced, placed, Allah, or have been displaced for a long time, how can we look for solutions, whether it's from governments, business, public-private collaboration? What, what would you suggest? Well, and I think, you know, to Filippo's comments earlier about the accountabilities we all share, I think it's actually really important to be looking at what are the basic needs. And so when we often talk about kind of the unknown and insecurity, but there are things we actually know. We fundamentally know. Everybody uh, needs an education. You spoke about employment. Um, the data shows that when a young girl gets educated, she is much more likely to be able to get employment. She's much more likely to then return that economic um, benefit to her community, 90% actually, as opposed to men who, not to put the men in the room on the spot, but return about 30 to 40%. Um, <laughs> And she's much more likely to then have to space out her children, to marry later, to choose when to marry, um, and to have healthier children. And so I actually see, you know, as you were speaking about employment, the very first thing that came to mind was how do we ensure that people even have the 
that they can even think in that box of like, okay, wait, there is an opportunity for me. And I do think that starts with, at its core, education. I do think that starts with a recognition that you deserve a dignified life and that we need to build in the processes and the institutions, because I wholeheartedly agree. We shouldn't be doing Band-Aid solutions, but we should also ensure that people today can live dignified and prosperous and opportunistic lives. And so that would be the first. The second is healthcare. It is nearly impossible, and I, and I will speak specifically to women because not only of my own lived experience, but my professional background, it is impossible to go to a woman and say, hey, can you work when she is unable to have agency over her own body, when she feels unsafe in the space she occupies? And women who are refugees and, and internally displaced are highly vulnerable to that. And so really being able to ensure that they have access to care to ensure that their children have access to care. And when I said there's, there's things that we know, we know things work, we know that women will have babies, so we need postpartum hemorrhage packages. We need an, an, an iron for women who are pregnant because anemia is devastating in terms of outcomes for children. We know that the first 1,000 days of a baby's life are the most sensitive 1,000 days. We know new babies need nutrition. We know children need immunizations, and so I think it's, I think there is an accountability of us saying, okay, how do we solve the long-term peace challenges? How do we actually address these long-term political solutions? But also, how are we acting in service of the communities that exist today? And so many partners, so many businesses actually provide these tools and services. So how do we engage them in the conversation and say what you provide in your emerging market or what you provide in your established market is something that you should also be contributing uh, to these communities? And the very last thing I'll say that uh, you know, both of you had touched on was, was the devastating conversations we're having politically about the financial accountability of countries around the world. It is, it is a duty for us to resource. And, and that doesn't negate from the self-resilience of these communities, but it doesn't negate us from the accountability that we also share. So we need to be passing policies and laws that permit the right to work and that permit uh, more freedom of movement and, and give them more security. But we also need to hold ourselves accountable and say, wait a second, you know, we're actually part of the problem here. So should we not be part of the solution? Should our tax, pay, is our tax dollars not be going to providing safety, security, and access to healthcare for communities that need it most? So I think there's both the political and, and the necessary challenges and, op and solutions. I also think there's very practical ones that we can all be accountable for today. So employment matters, but there's a broader context where social protection matters, health and education are crucial. We need to look in that broader context to ensure that people are supported yeah. with their vulnerabilities, to build on their capacities, and ensure that there is support from states, from businesses for the whole picture. Well, yeah, and I think, and I'll just say, I think it's all anchored in two things, agency and power. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we can have an honest conversation about how we, how we partner with and support and, and ensure the protection or employment, et cetera, of refugees without talking about the fact that this is inherently a conversation around power and agency. Ibru, um, what do you think the role of business should be in this space? You, you lead a large company. What's yeah. your perspective I mean, on that? Our, if the way that we are looking at this is, I mean, we have to, as the refugees are in Turkey now, it's been more than 10 years, we are just putting them into the workforce. And right now, we are talking about reskilling, upskilling of the workforce from whatever background they're coming from. So this is a very good moment to have all these refugees, especially women. I mean, I'd like to build on, on, on it. I mean, education is not enough. The current workforce needs are not coming with the education. We have to definitely develop some soft skills. And at this era of digitalization, I think there's a very big opportunity to train all these women, because we do also a lot of work in the gender to have all these women in the workforce as well. So I, I feel like this is also an opportunity time to build on these women refugees and to have more of these in the workforce. Fantastic. I think we've got time for one question from the floor if anyone would like to ask anything of our panelists. You have a very big women population. So. <laughs> well, I think it reflects the reality of vulnerable populations uh, around the world. But I know there's so many people in this room who have incredible solutions yes. in um, refugee and migrant and, uh, and IDP community. So if you'd like to also speak to that. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Pablo Escuartel, a journalist and also member of the board of the Humanitarian and media outlet that covers 
humanitarian crisis, especially forgotten ones. So I want to ask you about something that you uh, addressed before, that is the migration not only to rich countries, but to middle-income or low-income countries. In Chile, for example, we are a middle-income country, and we have uh, a very strong pressure on migration from Venezuela, uh, from Haiti, from Peru, from Colombia. And so there's a huge political debate now, and it's part of the political agenda against migration. So now this is terrible. It's a far-right uh, agenda that is you know, going everywhere. So now people in Chile uh, are feeling that migrants are against their own interests, they're taking their opportunities, and that all the money we have uh, for, for very you know, challenging the situation of middle class people should go to Chileans and not to Venezuelans or Colombians and somebody else has to take care of them. So what do we do to change that narrative that now is so strong and is politically you know, having a lot of success uh, in the elections? Thank you. So Sing. each of you in, in 20 seconds, what would be I your just, response? I just say, I mean, this is the same issue in Turkey. It's the nationalism. I mean, it's the world issue. And I think we have to fight with it. It's like, because we have to take care of this. This is our humanitarian responsibility. Well, no, and I was just going to build on that. I do think misinformation is a huge challenge across so many development issues. And you working at the New Humanitarian are probably doing some of the most incredible work, which is really shedding a light on the realities of these. I also think it's interesting, on one hand, we talk about refugees and IDPs as these like uneducated, incapable, you know, taking all of our resources. And at the same time, we're like, wait, they're so, ed they're taking all our jobs. And they're, and right? And it's kind of like, wait a second, what is the discourse we're actually selling here? So I do think interrogating it and, and amplifying and creating a surround sound about the potential, the resilience, but also the global accountability for these communities. Is this is a topic that needs to stay on our agenda and needs <laughs> to stay on the global agenda. Unfortunately, this session is a very short one but at the forum we'll be continuing this conversation there's a session of the forums refugee employment alliance this afternoon which will go into depth and look more systematically at pathways to solutions but i'd like to thank very much ala ibru and filippo for your involvement in this panel thank you very much to all of you. <laughs>